Praise the Lord, Bridgeway. So good to be back in the house of the Lord. Praise God. Good to see you. And uh, did you miss me? Well, Amber and I missed you guys, and it was so good to be away, to be together, uh, and to try to continue to work on our vision for the next year, as well as spend some time just recuperating from last year. And now we're ready to go again, back from my sabbatical. I'm going to do a series on the Old Testament character of Haggai. He's a minor prophet in the Old Testament. I'm going to tell you, if you want to get your Bibles out, I'm going to start preaching in just a few minutes. I have some opening comments. But for those of you who have a Bible and those pages are stuck together in the Old Testament, I want to give you a, a head start. Haggai is a small book of two chapters in between the books that have a Z. Zephaniah and Zechariah. All right, so there you are toward the end of the New Testament. So if you have a copy of the scriptures, uh, make your way there. Uh, today's message is entitled Blown Away, and it's the first 13 verses or so of chapter 1 of Haggai. Now, before I pray and go into the Word of God, let me uh, welcome those that are watching online as well as our Owens Mills Reisterstown campus. Thank you so much for being here today. I also want to thank all of our pastors our ministers, our elders, Elders Council of Women, all of our volunteers and our servants who've really carried this ministry as spiritual leaders over the summer while I've been gone as well as even when I'm here. So can we just give a, a round of applause for our spiritual leaders who have served us so well, as well as all of you volunteers who served over the last couple of days for the Global Leadership Summit under the a fine direction and service and coordination of Johnette Henderson and Stephanie Farnsworth and the whole team. So can we thank God for the Global Leadership Summit team? And finally, with regard to giving thanks, I just want to say throughout the summer, the creative arts ministry and the worship ministry have been killing it, making sure that we continue to lift up God and they have served us well through the creative arts. So can we just thank uh, Ronald and Dante and Pastor Jared and all of those who are in the worship and the creative arts ministry. I also want you to put on your calendar September the 8th, mark your calendars, because after this four-week series on the book of Haggai, as I do every year in Old Testament character for three or four weeks when I get back from my summer break, we're going to have our vision kickoff service. I'll announce the new theme for the year. You'll get your new bracelets that you can wear, and I'll give you the focus and the direction of our ministry. So I just want to make sure you have it on your calendar. Bring your family and your friends. We want you here on September 8th. That's the second Sunday uh, in September. Uh, also, I want to invite, and I don't know who this is for, so let me just give it to you very precisely. I'm going to Nigeria again in October, October 16th. Through the 23rd. I've handpicked a delegation to go with me at the invitation of the President's Office of Nigeria. I have two spots available because a couple people have dropped out. So therefore, I just wanted to make a public announcement. If God is calling you to go to Nigeria to be a part of my delegation, if you have $5,000, all of a sudden God ain't calling some of you. I understand. <laughs> I thought I was called. <laughs> I'm just calling out right now. <laughs> uh, and if you have the time available, uh, email me directly today, because we've got to get this done, info at andersonspeaks.com. When I was there last year, they conferred the chieftaincy on me and, and made me a, a chief there. And subsequent to that, they donated 10 acres of beachfront property right where the point of no return is where the slaves were taken away. And so we're going to go back and we're going to bless that land and cut ribbon there. And so, again, if this is something that God is just putting inside your spirit now, uh, info at andersonspeaks.com. When racial hatred and self-hatred combined with the proliferation of semi-automatic military-grade weapons converge on a people, it shatters lives and brings murder and brings death. And I'm so glad that we were able to reflect and pray in Owens Mills with Pastor Michener and here uh, in Columbia with uh, 
Pastor Scott Garber. Now, Scott Garber had mentioned in his comments as we were praying for this tragedy, uh, he had mentioned that he had been on the website as a pastor and, and uh, he was a former fake pastor here at Bridgeway Community Church. Well, Pastor uh, Scott, we love you. And uh, so today, let it be known in Columbia and Owens Mills that Scott Garber, Scott, could you come up here, please? Because I need our Owens Mills congregation to, to witness this. And love the Dayton, uh, Ohio uh, shirt. And sorry for all the people uh, that you know, where you were born there and, and all that, uh, that may have lost their lives. You served in five churches. He's been a senior pastor, uh, and he served in many churches. And, you know, he led us through prayer here in Columbia as Pastor Michener. Thank you for leading prayer there in Owens Mills. But Scott and his wife, Cindy, have been around for a long time. And so we just call him Pastor Scott. So as of today, he is being appointed and anointed as the pastor at large right here at Bridgeway Community Church. So thank you, Pastor. Let it be written, let it be done, and let it be put on the website. Pastor at large, Scott Garber. But, you know, I was away, Amber and I were out of the country, and when we saw all of the mayhem that was going on, I was just thinking, you know what, this is why the house of God is so important. Haggai, the house of God, is the title of the series. God wants the church of Jesus Christ, his house, to be a place of light and a place of love in the midst of a dark generation where hatred and where death is continually growing because of the fear that we have against one another. And God wants to use not only this message, but this series and even this moment to remind us that the power of racism is no match for the power of gracism. And that we have to be a people who will stand together and speak out, stand up, pray, and comfort those who are going through such difficult dissension. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal kill, and destroy. Proverbs says that the Lord despises those who are a, a dissension and creating division amongst the brothers. And so it's important for us as believers to understand that division and dissension is the devil's playground. And we have to show up as the body of Christ, and we've got to grow the house of God so that we can come against the evils of this world with the light and the love of Jesus Christ. With that being said, let's pray together. Lord, as we go into this word, I pray that this word will go into us. In Jesus' name, together everyone said. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel. Can you say Zerubbabel? For no purpose except I like the way it sounds. Go ahead and say it one more time. Zerubbabel. Yeah, you're going to name your grandkids and your kids that, right? The word of the Lord came through Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shittil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jazadak, the high priest. Let's pause for a second. I want you to notice it says that the word of the Lord, who did it come through and who did it come to? It says in a passage that the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to the governor of Judah, Zerubbabel, and to Joshua, who was the high priest. Not the same Joshua that followed uh, you know, Moses, these are many different Joshua, so that's why they always give you son of this and son of that. This Joshua, son of Jazadak, was the high priest. So notice these three characters, the prophet, Haggai, the governor or the politician, Zerubbabel, and the priest, Joshua. You have a prophet, a politician, and a priest. It sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. A prophet, a politician, and a priest walked into a bar. 
But the word of the Lord went through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the politician, and to Joshua, the priest, and hence the people. You see, the prophet in the Old Testament days was the vessel through which God's voice came to leaders, to kings. The politician was the one who was the governor of the land, who would take that word and activate it on the earth. If he was a good king or a good governor, he would do God's word. If he wasn't, he would not listen. And then you had the priest. The priest was the minister of the people and really the pathway to God. They would work in the temple, and if the people wanted to touch God, they'd go to the temple, they'd go through the priest, the priest would go to God on their behalf, offer sacrifices so that the people would be forgiven. But the Old Testament house of God was a temple that was being built. And that temple then was supposed to stand up to be an edifice that would glorify God, that would give hope to the people, and that they would know through the priests that their sins were forgiven and through the prophet that God was speaking to them and hopefully through the politician that the work of the land would be done in a godly way. Can you imagine if the prophet of God, the politicians, and the men and women of the cloth were all to get together to do God's will, what kind of world we have? If the governors of the land would submit to the God of the universe, God would do a revival in this place, and Jesus would be moving among the earth in such a way where there would not be so much hatred. God, let your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. But when people who are called by my name, won't do what I've asked them to do. They won't tend to the house of God. They won't live out the kingdom of God. Then you have so much depression and discouragement and death on the land. But Chronicle says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God wants to heal our land. Oh, God, we need repentance. Oh, God, we need revival among our people. We need revival among our politicians. We need our prophets to speak truth to power. In the New Testament, the house of God is the church of God. It's no longer a building built with hands, but each one of us is the temple of the Holy Spirit. When we invite Jesus Christ into our life and he cleanses us, he comes to live inside of us, and we now are the bride of Christ, the church. We are the house of God. Which means that we're all priests. According to Peter, every single believer is actually now a minister. You see, the priest in the Old Testament would go and offer sacrifices in the temple. But Jesus fulfilled being a prophet, a king, and a priest, and he was our high priest who then was sacrificed, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So he was the once and for all sacrifice, our great high priest, so we no longer have to go through another priest in order to get to God. Once we go to Jesus, he's the highest of all priests, and therefore, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He sits at the right hand of the Father, and when we come in him, he now is our great high priest representing us. As a result of that, each one of us are now ministers of the gospel. You know, we use titles like ministers, and uh, there are licensings for that and callings and things of that sort. The reality is every believer is a minister. Did you know you're a minister? And so here we have in this first verse, we see these three offices, but they're working together. The word of the Lord comes through the prophet, to the politician, to the priest, and hence to the people. Now, as we go on to verse 2, it says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? God is speaking through Haggai and he asked the question, it's been 18 years since you came back from exile. 
You built all your houses, you built your land, you built your businesses, you built your kingdom, and you leave the house of the Lord in ruin? 18 years. So verse 5, now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. 18 years you eat, but never have enough. 18 years you drink, but never have your fill. 18 years you put your clothes on, but are not warm. You earn wages. Only, listen, to put them in a purse with holes in it. You put in so much to get so little. Anybody tired of working so hard to get so little? You keep eating, still hungry. Keep drinking, still thirsty. Keep covering up with clothes, still cold. Some of you have been working 18 years, 28 years going to school for 18 years. It says you keep earning wages, but your money's still funny. Anybody tired of getting a paycheck only to find out every time they go to check on their account, the money's still at zero? You go to the ATM to find that another 20 is missing? That's what ATM stands for, another 20 missing. Verse 7, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. He says that a second time. Go up into the mountains, bring down the timber, and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. Stop. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. Anybody had great expectations only to see it turn out? to be little. He goes on to say, listen, verse 9, what you brought home, I blew away. <sighs> Work so hard to get it, finally you bring in a little increase, and God says, yep, what you brought home, I blew away. You worked so hard to get so little, and now you put the little you got on the table, and when I see it, I go, Phew. what, God? You're the one that blew it away? You see, you got to understand what God is saying. The value of taking care of my house is of utmost important to me, importance to me. Growing up, we used to rake leaves, and even in my house, uh, you know, when my kids growing up, we would rake leaves. And I don't know if you guys ever rake these leaves, but you rake them and you put them in these little pals, right? And then you go get the, the bag or the trash can, and you want to take it to each pile and, and put it in the trash can. But every now and then, something weird would happen. You get all these little pals, and before you could get the bag to put the leaves in, what would happen? <sighs> After all that work... And then the leaves just whoo, blow away. God is saying, you've been making piles for 18 years, and all I got to do in one breath whoo, blows away. God is saying, I want you to prioritize my house. And when God's people care more about everything else in their lives besides God's work and God's house, it grieves him. And sometimes God has to take some things away from us in order to show us what our priorities are and to get us back in order. Sometimes God has to go to our increase in order to increase our commitment to him and our priorities. Sometimes God will take us from plentiful to pitiful. 
And he does it sometimes because we've not prioritized his house. Not every time, but God is saying, you know what? I've been talking to you about this for 18 years, and y'all done built up everything else. Your businesses, your panel homes, you've been taking care of your kids, everybody else, but the house of God sits in ruin, and you've not paid careful attention to your ways, and so what you've worked for, you're not getting as much out of it as you can, and the little that you do get, I blow it away. And he goes on in this verse, in verse 9, why? Why declares the Lord? Why, Why would I blow it away? Why declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Busy with your own house. Too busy to prioritize the house of God? Too busy to minister to other people? Too busy to make time to praise God? God is saying, I blessed your life, yet you're so busy you can't bless me back. I blessed you with health and strength, yet you're too tired to worship me in church? I gave you those children, and yet you won't bring them to the house of the Lord to learn how to worship me? I bet you have time to drive them to school, drive them to soccer, drive them to swim meets, drive them to sleepovers, take them to restaurants, but then when it's time to worship me, nobody has time for the house of God. Preach, preacher. I'm just coming back from sabbatical, so you might want to put on your seatbelts because it's not going to get any better. Find time to do everything else. No time to praise God. You'll find time to read a novel. You can read everything else, but you can't prioritize reading the Word of God for three or four days out of the week for about ten minutes, but you can read a novel this thick, really, too busy for God. You could commute 30 minutes to an hour, to an hour and a half, but then when Sunday comes, church is too far. You can rob Peter to pay Paul. You can get a new car payment that's $100 more than you know you can afford. You can stretch to get a new house. You could create dollars to eat at the restaurant. You can order from Amazon, yet you can't get online and give to God online. You can't put in your online account money to come out every week or every two weeks or every paycheck or every month. But yet in a moment, you can download a song. Just keep the debit card open because if I hear something, I just want to download that one. Someone mentioned a book in a sermon. I just want to bring that book onto my Kindle. What about a Bible app? What about opening the Word of God? What about reading the Word of God to feed your soul? God says it's been 18 years and you're too busy. Too busy? Hmm. Ain't so busy no more because you ain't got a job. Ain't busy dating no more, are you? Because ain't nobody asking you out. The roof is leaking. The floor is caving. Hurricane just came through. Tire just went flat. Too busy? Let me slow you down. Finally making a paycheck. And you whining about giving 10% back to the Lord. What about when you didn't even have a job? 
and now you have a job and you get mad when the preacher talks about money. People get mad when the preacher talks about, talks about money. But you know what I've learned? I've learned, I've learned that generous people are never mad when the preacher talks about money. Generous people are the ones who are saying, you need to preach that thing because I know what it's like to have overflow. I know what it's like to have increase. I know what it's like to feel blessed when I can bless the house of the Lord. I know what God has done for me. So I want other people to get in on that blessing. I'm not mad at you, pastor. Preach about it. The people who get mad are probably the ones that ain't giving what they're supposed to. You don't have to clap for that. Because the bottom line is some of y'all mad right now. You haven't brought your tithes into the storehouse. You don't give online. You don't give in a service. But I bet you when you leave here, you're going to go get something to eat at a restaurant. And you're going to give a tip to a waitress. You'd rather tip a waitress than tie to the God who created the waitress and gave you the ability to eat. We got to get this right. God is tired of spiritual babies who make excuses for 18 years. Welcome back, pastor. I'm not through. And we got a few more weeks of this. If you can't handle Haggai, just come back on September 8th. We'll talk about vision and all that, okay? If you can't handle it. Because it's going to get a little bit hotter in here because God is tired. Listen, I'm speaking this because I want you to hear it. The people who get mad when you talk about giving money to God's church are the ones who usually are the stingiest people anyway. They're not just mad, they're stingy. And it's the stingy people who have anger issues. Stingy and grudging. God says, if you're going to give with a grudge, don't give. I don't need your money. I like a cheerful giver. Why? Because they smile and they're happy to give to the house of the Lord because they know the blessings of God fall for those who build the house of God. God wants people who give out of gratitude, not out of guilt. God is not trying to manipulate you. God is trying to liberate you. And there's nothing more liberating than giving to the house of the Lord. There's nothing more satisfying than serving the house of God. There's nothing more fulfilling than worshiping in the house of the Lord. So God is using Haggai to wake people up who have been asleep for almost two decades. And God is sending this message to those under the sound of my voice. Whether you're a prophet, a politician, a priest, or one of the people of God, God is saying, you need to stop this mess. God is saying, no more. And for those who have an attitude, watch yourself. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. I mean, I can imagine God in heaven rolling his holy neck with his finger saying, okay, okay then, so it's like that. You want to have an attitude, it's like that. It's been, it's been 18 years, you mad at people talking about it, it's like that, huh? Okay, well then, you know what I'm going to do? Let me throw verse 10 on you. Verse 10. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their due, and the earth its crops. Verse 11, I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. You want to keep persisting, not prioritizing God's kingdom, prioritizing your own kingdom, your own life, your own paneled houses, your own business, your own relationships, everything else is first but God. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you, but you want to live out of order, and you really just have a problem with coming into order. You just don't want to put God first. You don't want to put his kingdom first. Don't want to put his church first. He puts a verse 10 and a verse 11 on you. He says, hey, 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 I'm just going to go ahead and withhold the due. I'm going to call for a drought. 
Honestly, some of y'all are going through a drought right now. I don't know who you are, but you're going through a drought. Some of y'all haven't seen dew fall in a long time. And you've been wanting this increase and wanting this increase, and all you get is, whew. And then God takes the little that you do have, and he gives it to those who have much. Why? It doesn't make sense. Usually take from the rich, give to the poor. Uh Uh-uh. It's not about rich and poor. Because you can be rich and stingy. You can be poor and stingy, whether plentiful or whether pitiful. The bottom line is God is saying, look, I want to bless you, but I need you to do it the way that I have ordained. Seek first. You always have time for what's first. How many people brush your teeth this morning? Go ahead and raise your hand. Even if you didn't, you might want to lie in the house of the Lord right now. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying. No matter how late you are, you're going to brush those teeth, aren't you? Because you always have time for what's first. Even if you're late, you're going to brush those teeth. I was like, no matter what, I'm still going to read the word of God. I got to get God's word in me no matter what. That's what I'm talking about. But the problem is we are leaving God out of everything, making God last, and some of it just leaving him out, period. You work your jobs and leave him out. Go to college, leave him out. Go to elementary school, middle school, high school, leave him out. Pay your cable bill to watch TV, but you won't look at me. You got 100 channels, 500 channels. You got more channels than you can actually watch. And you won't look at me. You'll pay your energy bills and have lights, but you don't have enough energy to talk to me. You fill your refrigerators, but you can't feed on my word. Fine. I'll blow it all away. Why do we have to face disaster before we turn to the master? We wonder why we can't get ahead and why we face so many troubles. We live in a nation where everybody wants everybody else's opinion but God's. Polling everybody. Why don't we poll God's word? We want to listen to pundits and professionals and Polls. Why do we poll God's word? The latest poll from God's word says this. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The latest poll from God's word says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The latest poll from God's word tells us to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, But in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. See, God is looking for people who have the call of Haggai in their lives. The call of Haggai are the people who are committed to building up the house of God. Lawyers and doctors and businesswomen and plumbers and accountants and farmers and nurses and students, scientists and teachers, stay-at-home parents, whatever your role, you are using that role to build the house of God. You don't have to be in a professional ministry. Remember, you're all ministers. So minister where you are. Minister on your job. Minister in your neighborhood. Minister in your carpool. Minister online. If you're on social media, use that as an avenue to minister. Build the house of God. We are the house of God. And when we build the house of God, we build one another up and build bridges to our community. Then when tragedy happens, People have something to turn to. But if the church is in ruin, then people will have no hope. They'll have no help. And they'll have no way to know how to connect to a holy God that desires to know them and to bring them into peace with him. The call of Haggai are for people who are committed to using their gifts and their talents to build the house of God. Bring your tithes into the storehouse. And I will bless you to overflowing. But here's the good news, because when you get the verses 12 and 13, we find something out. That the politician, the priest, and the people got the message. God sent a messenger and a message, and guess what? If we obey it, 
He will forgive us and give us another chance. Anybody thankful for another chance? Anybody have another chance before? You know what another chance is. It's when God says, because you have repented, because you have heard my word, because you changed that anger and that bitterness into humility and acceptance, you can have another chance. That's what happens in verse 12. Listen to what it says. Then Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Verse 13, then Haggai, check this out, the Lord's messenger gave this message. Here's a second message. Gave this message of the Lord to the people. I love the second message. What did he say? I am with you. Wow. From woe to with, just like that, all it took was obedience to the voice of the Lord. The people of God returned to their first love. <laughs> it sounds like they finally heard what Jesus would say, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. They made first things first. The call of Haggai is when we strengthen the house of the Lord for the glory of God and the prosperity of God's people. Do you have this call on your life? Is it the call to build up God's house and advance the good news of God's blessings on the earth? Such a commitment to the house of the Lord will bring amazing blessings, not only to your life, but to the world. And you know what? What's worse is if you spend all of your life raking leaves only to have them blown away. Spend all of your life climbing the ladder of success only to find out at the end of your life that the ladder is leaning against the wrong building. Your purpose is connected to the house of God. Whatever you do, your purpose is connected to the house of God. Whatever your job, whatever your position, whatever your station in life, it's connected to the house of God. And if the house of God is in ruin, then your life will never really be blessed in the way that satisfaction and fulfillment come. So let me give you some practical applications before I land this plane and close us out in just a moment. Now, I've got seven of them. I've got to run through them quickly because I only have a few minutes, and the first few are going to be negative. So I'm just reminding you right now, September 8th, come. There is a vision message, and I will talk very kindly to you. But for these seven, uh, you know, um, practical applications, I just want to warn you right now, praise God, I'm back from sabbatical. Number one, stop being stingy with God. Now, again, I don't know who this is for, and if you're not stingy with God, you can just let this one roll by and be like, whoo, that ain't me. But if you are, face it. You know what, honestly? I'm being stingy because I'm fearful, because I don't know if God's going to bless me, because I, I have too many bills, I've been working too hard. Look, you've been doing that for 18 years. Where has it gotten you? Stop being stingy with God, with your money, with your gifts, with your talents, with your time to serve. Number two, stop being lazy with God. <laughs> if you're going to be tired, I'm just too tired. Oh, I'm so tired. Oh, I've been working so hard. I'm so tired. Look, if you're going to be that tired, be that tired serving God. You're going to be so tired. I ain't got no more energy. I'm so tired. Oh, my gosh. I can't. I'm so tired. Well, if you're so tired, be tired for a purpose. A purpose that's greater than yourself, that lasts into eternity. You're going to run yourself ragged and unhealthy and tired and weary for what? Stop being lazy with God. Here's a third one. Stop making excuses for not serving God with excellence. A lot of people just make excuses. This is God's house. So don't make excuses because it's church. Look, if you sign up, show up. If you say you're going to be somewhere, be there. If you're going to lead a ministry or serve in a ministry, do it with the same kind of excellence you would do if you go on the job. You wouldn't show up late and leave early. You wouldn't say you're going to be in a meeting and then not show up. But people are like, well, that's just church. Are you kidding me? 
This is your eternity. This is the eternal house of God. You would never do the things for your boss at your job and your profession that you went to school for if some of you treated your vocation like you treat your ministry. It's just church. Stop making excuses for not doing God's work with excellence. People talk all the time, that church, they just don't want performance. Yeah, it's performance. And it takes a lot of hard work to make it happen. Tired of the day when Mother Martha, who can't play the keyboard, comes up halfway through the song with her mittens on, trying to find a key. There comes a point in time where you've got to work to make sure that you memorize your lines, that you write the right keys, that when you sing, you realize you're singing for God. When you act, you're acting for God. You're not simply being spontaneous and filled with the Holy Spirit, which is great, but you got to work. And it's not just on the stage. It's in Bible study. I'll sign up for a Bible study. I'll go to three out of six of them, and the three I go to, I won't do my homework because it's just Bible study. Try to get a degree acting like that. I should probably slow down. I just, you know, I get kind of, kind of juiced up a little bit. But those are the three negatives. You ready for the positive ones? Everybody ready for the positive ones? Okay, we're done with those now. Ready for the positive ones? All right, let's get off the negative ones. Here the positive ones. Here you go. Time to pray. After the positive ones. Start seeking first the kingdom of God. Not just stop stuff, start stuff. Today, you can do it. You can say, you know what? I'm going to start. Here's the next one. Start asking God for forgiveness and mercy. He promises he will restore whatever you've lost. That's the kind of God you serve. He's so full of grace, isn't he? How many times have I messed up? So many times. And God still blesses. Because one thing that I will do is go to God and say, God, I'm so sorry. Can I try again? I'll try to do better. Anybody like that in here? God, I'll try to do better. If you're not a person who has confession as a regular part of your prayer life, start today. Start acknowledging God. Here's the next one. Start acknowledging God in all your ways. Proverbs 3 it tells us, acknowledge him in all of ways. Start acknowledging him in all your ways. Before you make any big decisions, just pause and say, you know what, let me acknowledge God. God, can you just talk to me real quick before I make this decision? Can you just give me some guidance along the way? And then make the decision. So start seeking God first. Start asking God for forgiveness and mercy. Start acknowledging God. Here's the seventh and the final one. Start enjoying God's presence and his pleasure. Because when you do it God's way, he says, I am with you. That was the second word of the Lord. I am with you. So what I want to do as I end today is I want to start this series with some good old-fashioned repentance. (laughs) And I want to ask you if any part of this word touched you today. And I don't mean just simply you connected with it and thank you, Pastor. I'm talking about God put his finger on something from whether it's the negative words, the positive words, or the jokes or whatever, but God made it very clear that this is something you need to change. This is something you need to acknowledge. This is something you need to repent of. Like them, they heard the word of the Lord and they obeyed it. And if that is you today, then I want to pray for you. I'm going to ask you right where you are to stand to your feet whether in this auditorium in Columbia or whether in our auditorium in Owens Mills, Reisterstown, because I want to pray for you. God, I hear you. You touch something. Nobody knows what it is, but I know what it is, and I hear your voice. Just stand where you are. Anybody else? Don't worry about whoever's sitting around you or near you. This is your moment with Almighty God. It's like you and him. And he spoke directly to you, and you heard it, and you're like, Lord, you know what? I got it. I got your word from Haggai. I'm on it. And I just want to say I'm sorry right now, right now. Anybody else? Go on once. Go on twice. If you're online, just just lift your hand up right where you are. God sees you. Owens Mills, I see you. Pastor sees you there. And God, for these people that are standing in your presence right now, I thank you for their humility. 
Lord, they're standing because they are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Maybe they were mad, maybe they weren't mad, but right now, Lord, they're humble, they're open. And so I pray that you would honor that they're standing in the house of the Lord or that they're waving their hand on the internet. Lord, we're sorry. Sorry for our sins. Sorry for maybe being stingy or lazy or, you know, making excuses. Whatever, Lord, we're sorry. Please forgive us. You say, search my heart and examine my thoughts and point any way out that is not of you. You've pointed it out. So I say, I see you and I hear you, Lord, and I'm going to respond. Thank you in advance for your forgiveness. By the way, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let's do that now. Go ahead and pray and invite Jesus into your life. If you don't know him, if you're not saved, if you were to die today, you don't know whether you'd spend eternity with God in heaven. Pray and ask God. Just say a prayer like this, or just follow me. Say, dear Jesus, come into my life now. I invite you to be my Lord and my Savior. I'm sorry for my sins. Please save me. I don't know what all that means, but I know that I'm turning my heart over to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you'd all just stand to your feet right now, I want to end with a 30-second praise party. And let me tell you what we're going to praise God for. And then you'll be released to go, unless you've got to get on out of here real quickly now. But <clears throat> if you prayed to receive Christ as Lord and Savior after the service, people will be down front. You can talk to them. You can stop in the Connection Corner, talk to them. Uh, remember, you can get food if you drive around the building or at Owens Mills. They'll point you in the room where you get the food. But this is what I want to do. When I, when I say one, two, three, go, I want us to use our, if, if you feel led this way, use your voice and use your heart to give God praise for what he has done for you and how patient he has been with you and with me. But here's the second part of the praise I want you to do. And this is, check this out. I want you to praise God for what he is going to do. Okay, I want you to praise him in advance, listen, as a, an advance praise to block the devil from even trying to stop what the Lord wants to do. Hang on, hang on, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. Because when I say go, I want to lift the roof here because I want you to have this moment right now to give him the praise because when you do this, I believe when those praises go up in the house of the Lord, those blessings come down. So are you ready to, to knock on the door of heaven with your praise and to receive the blessing? One, two, three. Praise the Lord. Come on, praise the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, God, for what you've done in my life. Thank you, God, for what you're going to do in my life. Thank you in advance for my kids coming home. Thank you in advance for the job that's coming. Thank you in advance for healing my body of the sickness. Whatever the doctor said, I thank you in advance for turning it around. Thank you for turning my marriage around. Thank you for turning my health around. Thank you for turning my finances around. Come on, give God praise for 10 more seconds on Wins Mills. Come on, you better lift them up. You better lift them up. Let me go ahead and turn it over to the Owens Mills pastor. Y'all keep praising over there. In Bridgeway here in Columbia, God bless you and don't come back next week, all right? See you on September 8th, unless you can handle it.